Brighton and Caicedo in shock as they show up to sign the contract and it's Matoma's name on the paper. This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast. My name's Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. That's right. We got Trossard. We're trying to get Caicedo. When in fact, the guy everybody may want when it's all said and done is this Matoma fellow who, as we sit here recording, has just scored an absolute beauty Echoes of Bergkamp in the style and the execution to beat Liverpool in the FA Cup uh, as Liverpool seemed more focused on getting sent off and not having to play future games than uh, than winning that match. And it really is a question, what the heck is going on at Liverpool? But thankfully, not a question for us. So what the heck is going on at blank club? We're not blank club anymore. And I am so glad that we are not. And I'm so glad you're here. Just absolutely love you for being here. Thanks so much. I'm going to tell you something. I think you know this if you've ever watched on YouTube or probably just been around listening to the pod. I am hashtag old. Most of the gentlemen that do this podcast are hashtag old. But we olds, you know, we can still learn new things. Forget what they say about old dogs. They can learn new tricks, maybe, we hope. I reference this because we are now on the talk tick. Is that what it's called? The talk? Yes. The the tick clock? Tick tock, that's it. We're on the clock app. I don't know why. But we're there. If you want to follow us, we're at Arsenal V Podcast. Would appreciate you doing it because apparently you got to get to 1,000 followers to be allowed to do a live thing there. And I want to do a TikTok live because my goal uh, on my wish board for this this year, is that what they call it? The vision board or wish board, whatever the kids are calling it now. For for 2023, I said, I want to be ridiculed by Gen Z. And I, I don't feel that that's happened to me enough in the prior years. So if we can do a TikTok live, then I can be ridiculed by Gen Z. So head over there, Arsenal V Podcast, give us a follow. Maybe we'll do some live stuff over there. And uh, I'd set the egg timer at about two months before we decide it's a huge mistake, fold it up, close the account, and uh, pretend it never happened. Okay. We got a lot of stuff to announce, and it's going to be announced soon. And I'm so excited, but it can't be announced yet. But just be prepared. We have so many fun things on the horizon for you. But what we have on the horizon right now is a man you know as Paul. You can find him on Twitter at Pause My Pants. Hold pause. Woohoo! What we can announce is that we have stuff to announce. Yeah. This is the announcement to let you know there's an announcement coming. The pre-announcement, if you will. Um, and you can find him on Twitter at Clyde PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. We can, Tim has um, been kicked off the pod due to changing his Twitter handle. Uh, I have to admit, Giant Gooner had a great idea that I'm not going to do, but uh, next time I, sh- I should introduce him at on Twitter at Little Dutch VA. The, uh, the old school people will know. The old oh, intro. yeah. Long times you heard that one, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Little Dutch Vital Arsenal, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Enough reminiscing. We are here to talk about the present and the future. We played a game, so we should just dive into that, right? This is sometimes called the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast, but I can talk about a game first when we got transfers to discuss, so we're going to start there. Moises Caicedo is uh, on the list. He's on Mikel's list. He may be on Todd Bowley's list. And if you've ever been a patron for us, you'll know this if you listened. If you're not a patron, totally fine, whatever. But you may you may want to do the sign up and quit thing just to listen to the last instant reaction we did because we did it as the Caicedo Twitter and Instagram posts were breaking. And it made for some hilarious listening. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen any player do it quite this upfront. And like what Mudrick tried to do flirtatiously for a month, Caicedo just did in black and white. Thanks for the memories, but it's time to say goodbye. Um, my favorite self-serving, attempting to be charitable aspect of his Twitter post was, hey, you can reinvest the fee I'm going to bring to the club. So, you know, you're welcome. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, it may seem unpalatable, but th- this is how transfers work. Let's let's get it right. Or as the kids would say over on the, the clock app, don't get it twisted. The club is interested in their money and their success, and the players are interested in the same, and it's totally fine. And Clive... I happen to like the player. We did a scouting video, maybe more raw than I expected, but still a huge talent. Tim made the point that Caicedo was a very sought after South American talent who chose Brighton so he could play rather than waiting his years and years to get his chance. And that seems like it's about to pay off. Why don't you give me the latest on what you know, whether you think this is the guy for us and whether you think this will get done this window. Yeah, just uh, that, just those subjects, just those things. Right. Okay. I'll give you a go. I'll I'll talk to you. you, I'll give you the the definitive (laughs) I think uh, on the player, bright, sharp, very good off the ball, um, very good on the ball. So that's quite good, quite quick, pacey, 21. When he went to Brighton, they were, Manchester United were looking. Smartly, they decided maybe we won't go for it. <laughs> I bet they wish they did now. Um, so, But hey, I'm sure that other clubs, there's no secrets in this world. I'm sure there are many clubs that had his name on their list. 
and Brighton stepped in and Brighton are incredibly smart. So yeah, as, as a player, I, I need to study him a little bit more. And we did the scouting video, and I need to go. I need to go again. I feel, but when I look at this player, you can just say it's because my crappy internet made the video skipping, and you couldn't yeah, really see what's going really on. You can just the... call me out on it. It looks I, great when you watch it, but you could. <laughs> you should thought... have to do what the rest of us do and go back and and watch the scouting video on Patreon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna watch it. Again. Sign up, Clive. Yeah, I'm, I'm there, mate. I'm there, honest. And I just need it. I wanted. I want to do it properly, you know, and see what do my thing, what I normally do, and I couldn't quite see it clearly. But, but for those people who are wondering if this is a good investment, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay something out for you now. Right, the football world is changing. The financials are very much Premier League centric, and there are movements out there. Newcastle are moving, Chelsea are moving, Liverpool need to do a rebuild. Manchester United need to do a rebuild. We're going to talk about Man City, and I I was sort of brave enough to say that I don't think City are where they once were. I think after playing them, without being... We know, we know they've got the powers to regenerate very, very quickly, but I'm not as scared of them as I once was. And so they need to rebuild in the central area. When these teams do that, you need to be able to stop the players they buy. So when Jude Bellingham lands somewhere, we need to be able to stop these players, project forward and think about the talent that's going to land in this country and say to yourself, how do we compete? How do we continue? How do we sustain and maintain? That's about your ability on the ball, your speed, your intensity, your energy. And if someone comes along that fits that criteria and adds to the primary identity of your team at an age that is going to give you five years, you've got to think about it. You've got to think about it. You know how how are we going to stop these teams? How are we going to go past them? How are we going to stay above them? How are we going to go past Chelsea when the, the guys just throwing money around left, right, and centre? So think, don't think about the game now. Think about where it's going. Think about the world talent that's out there that's going to land here, and think about our level of player that we need. Given the fact that our two primary players we don't even want to cross the road in case they get injured in Shaka and Party are thirty and twenty nine. You know, so this is important. And 15 million, 10 million on top will feel like chump change if we get it right and are able to compete at the right levels for a sustained period of time. Yeah, very well said. Uh, I'll just come to you quickly, Paul, because then I, I, I want to give my take on why I would do this. And I think people are going to have issues with me saying that based on some prior moves I've been against. But I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Paul, what, what's your take there? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Uh, Clive's take on where we're at, where we need to be looking, that we're going. Uh, maybe uh, a, a, a parallel point to that. As you watch the City game, you can't, like you think, well, this is the first of three games. It's almost like like an NBA series or a, you know, a, a baseball uh, late, late World Series kind of uh, se- sequence of games where you're like positioning each yourself against City in the first game. There'll be a, a counter response in the next game and the game after that there'll be another response to that. Uh, these matchups with players, with the coaches, with the but like it's not just three games. We're positioned now with our age profile, which leads to what Clive's talking about in a way that Liverpool, in a way that Spurs certainly, in a way that United just aren't at the moment. I mean, United's on the up, but there's so much work to do before they they work out all the kinks, all the bugs. All our kinks and bugs are basically out of the system. The age profile is such we're set for three, four, five years of the of a team uh, all on the same page, growing together. Where uh, every you're now adding players into a team that's already sorted. A whole different problem to what. Arteta had it at the start of his um, his uh, his joining the club, where he has two, three, four players he thinks he can trust, but he's not sure yet. And a whole bunch of players, he has no idea if they're the go forward guys, but he expects they aren't. Now he's got eight, nine, ten, eleven players, which he absolutely knows where he's at, knows what he's got, all works together. Now you're plugging in pieces to your jigsaw when the jigsaws by and large, mostly filled in. We're at a whole different point as we're building, and we're really not talking about the next three games. We're talking about the next three seasons, four seasons, how we match up 
we're the team potentially to match up against City and anybody else who can join the party in that time in a way we haven't been like we're the Liverpool at a point coming into our just about to hit peak cycle and we're looking at players that fit into that and as Clive correctly talked about who are we going to match up against the Jude Bellinghams of this world now going forward um, but it, it's a way better problem for Arteta and Edu to solve what's that extra piece or couple of pieces not Jesus who do we have What's going on? Who's going forward? Where do we start? Yeah, well said. I <clears throat> I think there's a few points there. Firstly, the last piece to be a title winner is going to be an expensive piece, right? It, it just is. Like, if you look at Liverpool, to your point, Allison costs more than Salah. Is that a better player, necessarily? You, you can't always be like, well... You know, Odegaard costs thirty-five million. So how are you going to pay seventy million for Kaiset? Like you're in a different position. You're making different moves. Would I do this fee for this player two seasons ago? Maybe not. There was too much work to be done. Too much had to be spent to rebuild the club, the the squad. But doing it now to both put you over the edge for a title and set you up for the future feels a lot more reasonable. I look at it this way: this fee is overinflated. So let's talk about that inflation. The reason I would do it is, this is a player who right now could be the difference between a title and not a title, but also is a player we would have wanted for the future. He ticks both boxes, right? Trossard was a little more borderline. He can play for us for the future, but it's very much a right now move. Caicedo's 21. He's, I think he's younger than Martinelli and Saka, okay? This is a guy who can grow with this group. If we signed him now and he didn't ever play until next season, he'd be a perfect fit for the for the group. In a position where we don't have that future player. Like the Mudrick deal was $100 million for a guy who plays a position where we have a starter who might be better than him. And we have another guy in Smith Rowe, if he ever gets fit, who might also be better than him. We don't know. Maybe the guy's messy. But it's certainly not a position that we needed to buy so desperately that it would win us the title this season and save us for the future. Whereas in Caicedo, as we know coming out of the City game, there's a party injury. Now, it looks like we dodged a bullet and he's going to be okay. But at that moment, you're looking at Sambi Lakanga, a player the manager doesn't trust and doesn't look engaged. So this is a move for now and a move for the future. And if it's $15 million more than it would be in the summer, but it 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 helps insulate our title challenge, inoculate our title challenge against its one huge Achilles heel right now. That's a weird mixed metaphor, which is a party injury. Then I, I think it makes sense. You, you see what I'm saying, Clive? I mean, it's not that, forget Mudrick's talent. Mudrick looks like a talent, I get it. It does. But you would have been paying a huge premium for a player at a position that I don't think you could say right now is a is an area of such need that without it, we 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 may not be able to sustain this challenge. Whereas I genuinely believe central midfield is one two week knock away from being in that position. So we need it for now and we need it for the future because the other thing is those left wingers are 21 years old. That central midfielder, as you pointed out, is 29 years old. It's a now and future move. And for that reason, I think it makes tons of sense. Yeah, it does. And whether it's that guy, because things can change earlier, I mean... I'm watching my Twitter as we, as you are talking. Things can change. And Arsenal are talking about going back in there uh, around 70 mil. And they might want 75 because Brighton are just, that's what they do. I believe mm. they bought a player today for 6 million euros, a Swedish midfielder. I'm not sure if he's a centre midfielder, but I saw that land. We should just there's, buy that guy right now for 50 yeah, million, knowing their yeah, scouting exactly. department, right? Just forget, um, forget Caicedo, buy the next guy they want yeah. for, for twice what he's worth. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. I, haven't, I don't don't know the players. I don't know if he's a simile, but but hey, they're buying, right? So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, I, I do see it. I I, I do. I, I will not say to anybody I didn't want Madrid, but that was a last summer thing for me, really, and we, we pivoted away from it, and I think that's going to be a big mistake. But let's see if I'm right or wrong on that one. Um, but yeah, I do think if you look at our midfielders, Granit Xhaka's done fantastic to bring himself to the, where he is, given the, how we've moved him around and changed systems around him. He's always adapted to the room. Thomas Party, imperious, um, 29 years of age. Is he going to be able to play three games a week next year when we really want him to? Not so sure. Um, that's to be debated. 
Zambi's really suffered because of El Nelly's injuries. So I think he's have to play too much time in the six and really is an eight. If you look at Zambi's best time at Arsenal, it was the period when Granit Xhaka was injured, when Lucas Moura jumped into his legs in the North London derby and we lost him for three months and Zambi stood in with Thomas Partey and we all thought, what a promising player this is. He was standing in a different part of the pitch to where we then had to use him when Onelli was injured, when Pai was injured, and we now judge him as a six when really he's an eight. And that's the truth. And during that period, he's lost confidence and lost belief and looks to me like he wants to leave the room, potentially, unless someone can put their arm around his shoulders. And Onelli's had two injuries in in a season. I mean, I think one, two knee injuries in the same season, potentially three monthers. Red flags everywhere there. One-year contract, one-year option. I don't think we're going to be sprinting to that option. You know, so we have work to do in this area, for, really, for two midfielders, if you're honest. Two midfielders going to have to come in, and they're going to cost. And I think we can afford to do it, based on the fact of where we're going to be playing football, hopefully. And given the fact we've got two or three academy kids that are at the level of Arsenal Football Club and cost us silch. Right, so we've just got a bit of... Unf- Misfortune with Smith Rowe's injury. But that that saves so much money for the club. Allow us to invest in the base of the team. And the base of the team, you know, you know, the front five, back five thing, you know, our back end of the pitch is looking looking quite good. You know, it's looking mm. really, really good. The player that <coughs> yeah. plays that hybrid role into the front five, who who could that be? You know, it's gonna be interesting to see from a midfield perspective. We have Vieira bedding in. It's starting to look proper serious you know? <laughs> proper serious I'm talking the biggest trophies in the game you know proper serious stuff where you can travel to places on a Wednesday and then do the Saturday morning BT slot with a good quality team the same week you know that's where you, we need to get you to know what? I agree with you Clive and I think Liverpool are a good cautionary tale in a way right because like we've seen Liverpool be the best team in the world and a season later due to one injury battling for fourth with backup center backs, then be the best team in the world again, or nearly, and then mid-table the season after. It can change so fast. And if you rest on your laurels because you think you're headed in the right direction and you're like, let's just let this marinate for a bit and see where it's headed, you know what? It could head a bad place. You got to be vigilant. You cannot look at football as a static development. You have to look at it as, as extremely dynamic and you have to be willing to do some things that protect you from your downside risk, right? Because... It can change. It can change so, so quickly. And like, we may be looking at Kivior as a critical signing later in this season. You just don't know, right? Especially if it's him instead of holding, and we can come on to that in a bit. But Paul, I do wonder too, I mean, clubs make a rod for their own back in a way. I remember Arsene Wenger famously saying, you can't sell Samir Nasri and Cesc Fabregas in the same window and say that you're a big club. But we did it, <laughs> right? Because at some level... You can only you can only do so much. Brighton already showed they were willing to sell a player they didn't want to sell in Trissard when the player pushed his way out, right? Trissard did some stuff to push his way out. And Caicedo saw that and said, okay, I see how this works. If I give a push, I might get my move. You know, anyone who's had kids knows how this works, right? You, you show them what the rules are and they play by those rules. This is just football. I mean, as, as a, a friend of mine says, it's just football, mate, right? Um, you know, the club, the clubs will do what's in their best interest. The players will do what's in their best interest. And I actually think that makes a more efficient market. You know what I mean? As opposed to pretending there's something else at play there. I do wonder, like, do you engage at all with the misgivings about, oh, Caicedo saying this or Caicedo saying that? We had an interesting off mic conversation before this about how in American sport, there's a lot more openness in the discussion of players getting their money and calling it a business trip. And when one player gets paid, other players from other teams being like, congrats on getting paid, man. You know, like the, it's just more transactional in that way. Football, and I think for, you know, to its credit and benefit, isn't as transactional in the way it's discussed. But Caicedo put it out there. I got, you know, got 10 siblings. Uh, I come from impoverished background. And I need to take care of myself and my family. Now, there's rumors he's making 3000 a week. I find that hard to believe. But even if it's, you know, I've seen other rumors, 16000 a week. Yeah, that's what I've Again, no, no one's going broke on 16000 a week. But if we're offering 100000 a week, yeah, I, I mean, I get it. And, and the chance to go chase the title and be the heir apparent to Thomas Party. So what's your, what's your thought on the way he's approached this and whether that should give us any pause or it's just sort of the, the way the whole machine works now? Uh, like 
he's pretty new to Brighton. He's there, what, best part of two seasons. So he's like he's from a different place, a different world in many ways. He's got it's not a whole, even two seasons yet, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. One and a half. One and a half, yeah, that yep. sounds right. So, like, he's just, he's a kid. Um, so I don't really have concerns from an Arsenal standpoint that he's out there talking maybe more than we might like him to talk if we were at our club in a similar situation. I mean, he's just young and he's got a lot going on and uh, there's a critical moment in his life he thinks like when you're 21 you think stuff's never coming around again if if your big move doesn't come and isn't mm-hmm. coming so like the from a personal standpoint i don't have too much uh, concern over what he's doing from a from a like my concern for arsenal in this is that it's an easy problem for brighton to fix they sell him down they say he's not going but hey instead of 16k a week we're going to give you 32k a week which is still uh, a huge jump to him still within their paradigm or like i don't i don't know what their wage structure is but i'm sure they have something above where he's at where they f- fix it in the short term and say we'll get you your move in the summer they could or- put a release clause in right they could say we'll take we'll take 70 in the summer but we need to keep you now here's your raise here's your release clause we yeah. won't hold you back yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of, like they got so much slack on their side. There's all sorts of things they can do to make it right with him so he feels appreciated and twice as wealthy <laughs> in the <laughs> yeah. space of one day. And he's like, they, he'll settle down to he'll get his big move in the summer or whatever they come up with. So I can see Brighton have a lot to work with here. So what it really comes down to is the owner of Brighton has his playbook as to how he does these things. And he may have a scenario in which he's willing to let go of any player. Like, they don't need to do anything with Caicedo. They can hold on to him. They're doing great in the league. They're making money hand over fist. But Brighton have their uh, paradigm, their structure of how they do these deals, when they'll sell, when they won't. I know Andy Naylor, the journalist on The Athletic who covers uh, Brighton, has been saying stuff and... Arsenal fans have been making fun of him. Things like they won't sell until the price they want has been met. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's real genius there. But like some clubs say it and some clubs mean it. And like he's got a pretty good hand. He's got lots of chips on his table. And I think it's actually true. I think more than mo- uh, pretty much any other club, uh, there's a scenario in which they will sell a player if it meets their. The, their structure, their paradigm, et cetera. But like, it just might not be 65. It might not be 70. It might be more about timing than anything else. So it, on the other hand, I don't think Arsenal is going to be in there talking to them if Brighton isn't interested in talking. I mean, yeah. if Brighton have really <clears throat> said, we're just not selling them, guys. Don't waste our time. Uh, we have a good relationship with the club. If the, we make another bid, it's because yeah. Brighton are willing yeah. to talk. That look, that that's the thing. We sometimes get, and I'm guilty of this. We sometimes get so caught up in it being a sport and football and tribalism and all the things we get caught up in. We forget it's business. Put on your business person hat for a minute. What does that hat look like? I wonder. Put up just whatever hat that is. Put it on. It, Mine's it, like uh, a headband with the little Martian balls that bounce at the top. Um, you know, you know that uh, was it Streets of New York or something? The one with Daniel Davis. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. That's my hat. I got one of those hats. Yeah, for, he was, for he was a pretty cutthroat business person. Yeah. I mean, if you want, if that's who you want to be represented by, you know, yeah. live your truth. But but think about like this is very easy. If Brighton aren't going to sell, you know, people are like, well, they might say they're not going to, but they do. You get in a room and you say, is this a negotiation? And they tell you, you know, there may be a negotiation to be had, but you're not close to where we need to be for this. That tells you there's a negotiation. Right. If they really wanted to end this, they could say, listen, there is no price at which we will sell. Stop submitting bids. We will not accept them. You will not get the player. This negotiation is closed. We will not take your calls. We will not meet with you again. You're it's unsettling very, our player. And if you do this, we won't deal with you in the future. We're, we're going to put a charge you know, out on you for tapping up. Yep. I mean, like they, 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 can te- they can make it clear there's no deal to be had. That's not what's happening here. That there is no question in my mind with three days left in the window, two days left now, whatever, 
we're in this conversation because we think there's a conversation to be had. I know we're looking at Zubamendi supposedly and, and Declan Rice. Declan Rice is not happening right now. That's my belief. Zubamendi says he doesn't want to leave La Real, right? Sociedad, they're, they're, I guess, notionally in a title race. It's his hometown club. He's an, an academy kid there. Mikel Arteta has very strong ties to that club himself, so he will be across whether that is doable. Uh, Clive, I mean, let me ask you about that. First of all, is Caicedo the one? Do you believe that Zubamendi or Declan Rice might be better and to what extent do you think those deals are mutually exclusive? Like, if we go for Caicedo now, do you think the Declan Rice deal's off the table? Do you think it could be both? Should we be shifting our gears here? I mean, there's no question we're overpaying for Caicedo in my mind, but for the reasons I've laid out before, I, I'm i all for it. What do you think about those other two links and how all of this sort of stitches together? Yeah, no, I think there's three links, really. I think um, the Declan Rice one, for many learned people, they're saying that he's very keen um, to come to Arsenal and very keen to develop himself further as a football player. And uh, it's good to see somebody think about his football career and joining a coach that can develop him. And I think that's very, very smart from his perspective. Everyone thought he was going to go to Chelsea due to his background, due to where he played his youth football. But at, at this moment in time, as we speak, um, that's not what's going to be happening potentially. Um, Super Mendy, uh, him and Arteta said, share the same agent. A bit more of a Spanish style, Busquets style six, a bit more of a technical six, sit behind, very technical. He, he jumps out and sprints into challenges, not a big smashing tackler like Caicedo who just blows your legs up. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, he, he doesn't quite do that. He steals the ball off you. Barcelona so he, are linked to him too, right? Wasn't there a link that they yeah. wanted him to be the Busquets heir apparent? And if they sell like a building or the their shirt or, you know, maybe yeah. like tear down the, the new camp, they might be able to... Um, Sell one of their levers. Yeah, they yeah they might they might be able to get him actually. <laughs> and the only reason they've not got him is the price, you know, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that price to the Premier League is like, okay, where do I sign? You know, um, <laughs> and so that shows Pocket you change. <laughs> that shows you how we started the podcast off. There's a different world out there, right? So we can now mm-hmm. make that happen if we so want to. Um, there's one other player that I have studied and was able to see the video is Ibrahim Bamba. And mm. whatever we do in this area, I think we miss tackling. We have players that can play eight. You know, we have Vieira, we have Smith Rowe, we have Trossard, we have Shaka, we have Sambi. We have players that can play the second guy. But the first guy, I think we need defensive security. You know, Thomas Pye does everything. We're not going to find that, that radar every day of the week, right? He does everything. But what he does do, he knows when to go jump out and take the ball of people and protect it between his centre backs. And mm-hmm. if if we don't get Caicedo, the one I'm looking at is Ibrahim Abamba because I think he does that. He has played centre back. He's very sharp, very tigerish. Tackles can move the ball. Can't move the ball like Thomas Partey does at this age. You know, not based on what I've seen, but I don't think any, I don't think anybody can. He moves. Thomas Partey is like a. He's a he's a proper centre half defence defensive midfielder like Declan Rice is. When he has a ball at his feet, he turns into Thiago. So you find that mix, it's not out there, right? So um so I think Bamba could be a sneaky one. I just got this sneaky feeling for him. And uh, of all of this, if the Kaiseido thing goes north, it could happen. Because in all of this what we're talking about, and we all get excited about transfers, me more than most, there's one thing in the background that just bothers me. It's called Chelsea Football Club. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and the rules of the game don't apply to them. And well, we are forgetting they bid fifty five million for Caicedo first, and it got rejected. And the chat in the game was he was happy to wait for Chelsea in the summer until Arsenal came along and turned his head around. Mm-hmm. So they're sitting there thinking, "Hold on a minute, let me just let this play out, and we'll sit in there and do what we did with Mudrik." So for me, I'm looking at the attributes of the player we need. We I'm not even going to get onto Man City, but you can see what happens when you have a less defensive aware player in the middle of the pitch, not sure where to stand to control that area. You can see what happened to the structure of our team. It broke. Right? And um that's not so much the player, it's the style of player that you need. You know, and I think that's very important. Mm. We add we add, we add that to the group and that will give us the security we need for the title running, Elliot. <laughs> I just got chills when you said that, Clive. Uh, Deserbian his press conference following the Liverpool uh, FA Cup tie. 
I would like him to finish the season with us, but we are ready to go forward without him. I do wonder, and I this may be more fan wow. think than real think. I do wonder if having Liverpool rock up to your place in the FA Cup and beating them and knocking them out without Caicedo makes you think, let's just cash in now. Let's get rid of the one away player. We can still have a special season. We can still have a cup run, Clive. I was just going to say on that, we're, we're, we're learning about Brighton and we, we all think mm. we got their number. But this is Tizerbi's Brian. And Trossard and him fell out. And bang, he's gone. Kaiseda's come out and said, I want to pretend I want to move. Let's see what happens. So the identity of the club is maybe tweaking slightly to the identity of the manager and how he wants to run his dressing room. Right? So we don't know Tizerbi's character. We were questioning Trossard's character two weeks ago. When he's running down the ring past Carl Walker or, or, and Rico Lewis, we're not questioning his character anymore. That's, that conversation stopped, Elliot. Do you know what I mean? We're looking mm. at his feet. You know, so um, so let's see. Is this a deserby thing? We don't know. Maybe maybe not all the players are feeding him. You just don't know, right? You just don't know what's happening behind closed doors, right? None of us do. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting how this stuff happens. Sometimes you just get a feeling. I'll just admit, I can't picture Declan Rice playing for Arsenal. Not because he's not a good player, not because we're not linked, not because he's not interested. <laughs> I just can't see it happening. I, I don't know why. I feel like there's something about these big, high-priced, up-and-coming English stars. We've never done that in in the last 20, oh, 23 not... years. I mean, Ben White, I get it, but he wasn't he wasn't where Declan Rice is in the game. You know what I mean? Ramsdale, same thing. He was pretty low profile, wasn't he? I think so. I mean, I, I mean, maybe not in the game, but like more broadly. They weren't guys, all talking about where White was going to go next. Like we don't sign Rice. the Jack Grealish. Mm. We don't sign the Declan Rice. You know what I mean? Like, I, am I wrong about this, Is, mm. Clive? Please, you want, you're well, I'm going to have some heartache over this. I know. <laughs> well, yeah. no, no. I think it's about I, Bellingham. Clive's still mourning <laughs> Bellingham. <laughs> <laughs> well, it hasn't well, happened yet. Well, that that, that <clears throat> ties. You, it's Paul. You've just read my mind up to a point, right? Um, <laughs> because you have to you have to look at that England group and say to yourself, which ones of those are gettable? Mm. Right? Seriously gettable. That's going to benefit our first thirteen. Let's just call it right. Our first thirteen to where we're going. Bellingham is one, right? But I'm not willing to give up a kidney, right? So um, Bellingham is one. And you're going to have to give up something big for him because he's boosted his price beyond belief. Right? So, and Declan Rice your is... your loins, Clive. You might have to give up your loins. <laughs> that would be a small price to pay. Let's, let's, be, let's be clear about that. <laughs> <laughs> I would pay that on Clive's behalf. <laughs> if you look at all the other young players like your Foden, they're not, he's not going anywhere. Right, Saka, he's not going anywhere. <clears throat> cough, cough. He's not going anywhere. Um, <laughs> hey, Martinelli signed, so he's not going anywhere. He's not he's, English. Just know, bring it up. And, and so you look at the back line. You know they're they're not young, right? So um, Luke Shaw, he ain't going nowhere. You know he's settled in and he's he's settled in. So you look at the group and you look at there's two young players that are sticking out at you, saying, "I'm homegrown. I'm ready to come to a Champions League club." One's Rice, one's Bellingham. One's got a contractual opportunity. One's going to cost you half the stadium. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got to look at it from a business perspective. Homegrown player in your group, mate, you know what I'm saying? So I'm yeah, with you, Elliot, I, I mean, but I see the sense in it. I really do see the sense oh, in it. Like I, like I said, it's more just a feeling thing. Like, I can't picture us getting Rice. It's it's not that I don't want him. It's not that I don't think it's a good move. Yeah, I can't it. picture us getting Bellingham. I can see us getting Caicedo, and I can see how that fits in with what we're trying to do. I can see us getting Zubamendi, right? I Because I see the link with Arteta. I, there are moves that I see and moves that I struggle with. It doesn't mean I'm right about them happening. Um, I'm Paul, with you, Elliot. I, I yeah. think there's one thing, though, we're adjusting to, which is this club has never been owned by the Cronkies properly. Like, I do actually now buy the, they weren't going to make big moves while Yuzmanov was yeah. a 30% shareholder. And if you look back at it and you say, and you imagine that that was when they bought the club, and you look at our the business we do and the moves we make, they're pretty big moves. It's like yeah. a new ownership. Can I stop ownership. you just to clarify yeah. something? Just because I think you might be taking my point, uh, not how I intend it. I don't mean I don't see them spending it. 
Yeah, no, I'm I saying it's that I'm specific with you. play. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm with, I'm, yeah, because I think I'm, they'll spend. <laughs> Clearly, I'm trying spend. to make my own adjustment oh, because yeah, my reaction do. to Declan Rice is the same thing. Nah, he ain't coming here. He's going to Chelsea, or uh, yeah. but it can't be Chelsea because he's been there and they got all the. So he must be going. And I'm like, well, where else could he go? And I'm like, well, actually, maybe Arsenal makes the most sense when you look yeah. at his options. And I'm like, okay, well, the world has changed. Like well, it well, is you know feasible, the, the, Bellingham comes here, except it's such a probably going to be such a ridiculous amount. But besides that, uh, it's like, yeah, actually, this could be the club for him, and he could be the player for us. It's just going to be completely ridiculous, and there's probably better ways of doing it. I'll say with you, <coughs> but think think about how like Barcelona got Cesc there. Now, granted, that that was the club of his youth, but like he'd go off and play for Spain. Right, and he'd be around Shabby and Iniesta, right, and they'd be putting yep. shirts on him and all that nonsense that we hated. But like, we're an England group now, right? Yep. You go off to play for England, and Ramsdale's there, and well, I was going to say White's there, not so much anymore. But Sack, you know, Sack is there, and you're you're hanging out yep. with your. And you could look at it that it's us or City for the next three or four years. I mean, that's the reality: us or City. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's entirely possible. Like, uh, we'll, we'll just have to see. So. I think we should start to shift off this, but let me just ask you, Paul, sort of point blank. Forget money, mm-hmm. options, alternatives, <laughs> any of that stuff. Yep. Do I'm you ready. think the player is good enough to make the difference now and into the future that this is a deal? Forget the price of it. Is this the deal for Arsenal to do right now? You know, it probably is. Uh, if it comes in at something like $70 million, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on Caicedo, uh, I haven't seen him more than anybody else. I've watched our scouting video. He's a bit raw. I think Arteta can do wonderful things to fill in the gaps there. And in that sense, it's kind of perfect for where the player is. He can. Pl- I love this move because you can legitimately see him playing two key positions for us. We need support. The one place, two, the kind of the one area of the field where we have a 29-year-old and I guess a 30-year-old and... We're going to have Champions League. Uh, the bad news, Caicedo, is you're not starting in the Premier League mm-hmm. on Saturday. You're starting in the Champions League on Wednesday. Suck it up. You know, your time will come. That's a good conversation to be having. And uh, We got all the need in the world. We are going to be in the Champions League next year. Uh, there's going to be loads of quality minutes for these guys. That guy can play two positions. Um, you know, it's just going to happen. And then you look at the quotes. I mean, I... Normally, I'm like, I'm protecting myself. But the quotes from De Zerbi, I mean, who says this on a Sunday when the window's about to close? I would like him to finish the season with us, but we are ready to go forward without him. Would uh, would you say that you were only partially listening when I read that quote out like three and a half minutes ago? Or uh, well, uh, well uh, no, no, no. I just thought it needed to be repeated. No, no. I, but like, you didn't say it the good way, and That's, then I didn't. I, I didn't use my my. Uh, you, if you missed the instant reaction, I put on <laughs> instant a couple of Churchill voices. voice. You the Churchill win. voice. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. there's another one. I don't expect nothing. Tony Bloom knows my opinion in terms of transfer market. I told him we need some player in some position. I mean, I can't read those without thinking De Zerbi's been yeah. reading Fabio, uh, whatever his Fabrizio name is. Fabrizio Romano. <laughs> Fabrizio Romano, and he believes the rumors. So. It would have only been better if he said, look, here we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. going to need a midfielder. <laughs> That's a Fabrizio joke if you don't get it. Um, I think we should pivot to football. I, I hate to switch off transfers to talk about football in the middle of a football season when we played a football match, but I think we should do it because – we we do have an obligation. I'll say this. It feels like it's happening, but the problem is I don't know which club it's happening for. You know what I mean? So let's uh, let's keep our eyes open. The, the one thing that's clear, right, is that Bowley's entire strategy is that he's bugged Adu's office or at a minimum has a Patreon account for us and is watching the scouting videos. Let's do this. Let's tell you that this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. I feel good about this sponsorship, I think. I mean, it's a company tries to make health, uh, mental health accessible. Like that, that's just a good thing to want to do in the world. There's no such thing as perfect company, a perfect approach to anything. But for me, mental health is something that we need to just normalize as a part of health, not a special segment of it. In the same way we think of eating right, in the same way we think of exercise, in the same way we think of going to our doctor, we should, we should use mental health for maintenance, not just for crisis. Because sometimes using it for maintenance avoids crisis. 
So let me tell you some specific things about BetterHelp that I think um, make it worth looking into. There's no, you know, it reduces the friction of trying to get into mental health, right? I got to find someone. How do I find them? Then I, you know, is their office nearby? Am I going to hop in the car and drive there once a week and take the time to do that? Am I, you know, is it going to be affordable? Am I going to click with that person? What if I don't feel comfortable being in that room with that person? I want to be a little more anonymous. You can get rid of all of that, right? You can get matched with someone in hours. You can um, find someone that fits your needs. You can find someone that fits the specialty area that you need. These are licensed therapists, Right. Um, you fill out a brief questionnaire. You can go camera on, you can go camera off. So it's easy access to a thing that's going to make you a healthier, happier person. If you are struggling, then I definitely think therapy is essential. If you're not struggling, but you just feel stuck or you you feel like you could just improve. You know, you may be in great shape. Doesn't mean you stop going to the gym. You might feel mentally healthy and think, you know what? I want to work with a therapist. Because frankly, like, you know, I've been married a long time. Your partner's not your therapist. That's not to say don't talk to them about what's going on. But this is professional work. It should be done by a professional. So if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash vision today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com, betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash vision. Do it now. Clive. Is that enough of that? Indeed. Nailed it. Mm. 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 Oh, yeah. That gets me going. Did, did, did a, a bump of sponsorship, and now I'm ready to go through the next the next 30 minutes of podcasting. How come you're more into sponsorship and stuff than the actual football, Elliot? Because I feel like people listen to my sponsorship more than me trying to read out Deserby quotes and having you read them back to me three minutes later. That's what that's all about. I know no one's listening when I'm talking. I'm not Give putting me a my crack clips of that on. indeed, I'm, Dad. I'll show my... you. I'll not, show you how it's done. I bet you will. <laughs> you show me how quickly you can lose a sponsor. I'll tell you, tell you what I'm not doing. I'm not putting clips of me up on the talk, tick, clock app. They're all Clive clips. Tickety talk. That's the one. Clive, I got I got to tell you some breaking news. What's you want it? Mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Played a football match on Friday. Mm, I, I know it's it. hard to keep up with this stuff when there's transfers on. Arsenal played a football match. Let's start with this. Uh, we did get knocked out. I think the performance was creditable. We'll get into that component of it. What surprised me is Mikel Arteta and I don't always see eye to eye on everything. I think it's fair to say he has his views on football and they're valid. I'm not saying they're more valid than mine. Okay, they might be more valid than mine. But he's got his views and I've got my views. We don't always see eye to eye. That's fine. I didn't think he'd rotate as much as he did. I thought he'd want to go to Manchester City full strength and see what we could do up against them. He rotated more than Pep. And I think it was the right move. I think he got it exactly right. I mean, maybe I would have liked Party not to have started, but the minute El Nenny wasn't available, I think we knew Samby wasn't going to start that game. I'm curious if you were as surprised as I am by his willingness to rotate and not show his hand, so to speak. He's got Manchester City coming to the Emirates in a couple of weeks, and that's the game that matters. He kept something in reserve, and I think it was the right way to do it. Obviously, you didn't listen to the podcast that me and you did on Friday together when I actually said we would rotate in that podcast and took a I, lot. I, I know you did. I was teeing you up. That You know what that's <laughs> called? That's called giving you a platform. I'm like Martin Odegaard. I'm just, I'm just rolling through balls through to you. Instead of smashing them in the back of the net, you're turning around saying, put it on my right foot. <laughs> <laughs> now, joking aside, though, we had a discussion about lineup, and I sort of said we'd, we'd rotate a fair bit. And because I, I, I prioritize squad harmony, I said, you can't tell people that you you love them. And when the chance comes to play, you say, actually, I don't love you that much. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You just sit down. It's, that's not how it works. It's not how it works. You have to be consistent in your messaging. If you trust people mm-hmm. and you want to put people on the pedestal, you have to play them when the opportunity is there. You have to. You have no choice. And this is a, a second-tier competition, whether you like it or not. That's what it is. It's not the way we grew up, but that's what it is now. You know, you get 120 million for finish last in the Premier League. And that's what it is. And this is the truth. You get 5 million quid, I believe, for winning the FA Cup. I'm sorry. A good day out ain't enough anymore for lots of people. Those Spurs would kill for it. Right? So, um, and so I, I thought we'd rotate. We did rotate. But actually, I, I, I looked at this game. It, it couldn't be more perfect how it all turned out. And now, now we know parties pretty healthy couldn't be more perfect and i looked at it as one big scouting mission it was just one big scouting mission more things are now in the laptops of our analysts and 
I loved how we approached it. Actually, I loved our aggression. I loved how we how we played against Haaland. And it's very important, Elliot. Sometimes you you got to feel that player, feel his power, feel his movement. And I love what we what we did and how we dealt with him. And I listened to his reaction. I know you guys were a little bit critical of Rob Holding, and but but I I actually thought he played a perfect role, a perfect role. So we we were speaking about NBA earlier on. Do you remember when um, LeBron used to always play Toronto Raptors, and they used to throw bodies at him? They used to they they signed Serge Ibaka and they threw him at him to to um. to. I think you're thinking of the new HBO TV show, The Last of Us, with zombies. No one was throwing bodies at anyone. That's a dystopian future we have not arrived at. No, yet, but no you know what in. I mean by that. By by the power athlete on the other team, you yes, throw yes, bodies at him. You take your fouls. You throw another body at him. I love the way mm -hmm. we threw Rob Holding at Harlan directly. Throw him at him. Don't worry about it. We'll cover around. You just stay touch tight. We threw and, him into their machinery to gum up his works, basically. Yes, and, yes. And, and so if you think, if you think, I want to, again, another player that I was, I've been following his career, actually, a guy called Ben Goffrey. I used to want Arsenal to buy him a few years back, but he's gone a bit crazy lately. Everton threw Ben Godfrey at Haaland. And I think Everton got 1-1 one, one draw in that game. Very similar, very tight, very combative fouling him and Haaland got sucked into a one-on-one -on -one battle and lost his game. Well, right? lost a lot of his game and City lot lost to their game. I thought that's very interesting and Arteta being an ex-Everton man, I wonder if he looked at that and said, I'm going to do the same here. Rob, you just go mm. you go smashing into him. Go on, knock with, yourself with out. With Gabriel to cover in behind, right? Exactly. On the piston, Gabriel covers round. Mm -hmm. They haven't got no speed anymore to worry about. Haaland's the only one, so don't let him turn. Don't let him bounce off you, secondary run and accelerate, because then you got then you're in trouble. Right? So but we're gonna go tight to him. Do not let him turn around. Do not let him get speed up. Do not let De Bruyne get his head up to find him. Because they are like the old Steven Gerrard, Fernando Torres link. That, that year Liverpool mm -hmm. had them two up front. It's exactly the same thing that City are trying to do. But it's one dimension. The commentary can... Clive was interesting because uh I can't was it Martin Keown, but he was saying he's getting too close to him. He's getting nah, touched they tight. Weren't and they weren't reading yeah, it yeah. right. I was furious at home, going, "Ah, oh, I wish I was on the Instagram reaction." <laughs> I would. I, I wish I was on the Instagram reaction. I I'm thought this Clive is great. Fired now, up here. by the way, if they had Leroy Sane on the left wing, that will sprint a million miles now, you can't afford to go touch tight with him. But if, the, if you mm. do lose the battle and they flip it out to one of the wide areas and you got a hundred meter sprinter, you're in trouble. But Jack Grealish is quick with the ball, but he's not quick without it. And Mares wants it to feet. No Foden, there's no one running through that we can't handle. Nobody. So I, bring I thought the best we, out of Clive. I think uh, I think it was quite aggressive. You lot team me up, didn't you? And then then you, when you put the phone there, you like laugh. Okay, we got him going again. But I'm, seriously though, I've been studying City, and we all know their quality, right? So it's not a caveat. But I think this team, we can handle them. I'll be much more concerned with speed in wide areas, they were to really push into the areas behind us quickly. But they play through us, and we are quite sharp to get to the pitch of the ball, create transitions, and play through them. And one of the best things that came out of that game, Elliot, was your boy. When he came on late, and he ran around their fastest player on the outside, Martinelli ran Walker, I went, whoa, we're... I'm telling you now, we walked away with a lot of good stuff with our laptop, mate. I'm telling you, mm -hmm. I can't wait for the 15th of February to see if we can get properly close to them. Pep yeah, I said this name checked three players. Sorry, Elliot. He met, name checked at the end Martinelli, Saka, and Odegaard. And uh, Sa S Martinelli and Odegaard, because of the difference they made to the way we played. Uh, Saka is interesting because he mentioned it regarding Nathan Ake and what a great job he did keeping him quiet and I look forward to that being pinned up in Saka's locker for the next game I think Saka's going to take him apart he, he may um, but he, he doesn't have to do it alone. There's enough talent here that he doesn't have to do it alone. I, I want to say something I said on the instant reaction because I think it is important. I'm going to praise this performance and I'm going to say that I think this is just about the best outcome. I know there are people listening who will think that's a loser's mentality, um, which is fair because I'm a complete loser, but that's another issue. Uh, you know, who will say like, we should try to win every game we're in or why are you willing to throw away a trophy? This is a trophy. Do you not want to compete for all the trophies? Like, 
I will not tell anybody who feels this that way they're wrong. I will simply say I see it differently. I see the opportunity for a title being so great and so important to the club that we should do everything in our power to protect it. And I do think there's going to come a time in April when Manchester City have no place to put the fixtures and maybe it costs them three points you would never expect in the Premier League. And those three points let us lift the Premier League trophy. And if that is the case versus the opposite happening, I think everybody would agree it's worth it. Now, I get it. It might not work out that way. It may not. We may lift no trophies this season. But I don't think there's anything wrong with believing that the current state of our squad being what it is and the current need for this club to go win a title is so great that even a 5% better chance of doing it might be worth the FA Cup, which, oh, by the way, we've won four times in the last six or seven years, whatever the heck it is. So I'm totally okay with it. Paul, the thing that I think... Let me say this about Rob Holding, too. There are two ways you can grade a performance. You can grade a performance out of 10. To me, it's like a 5 out of 10. But you can grade a performance pass-fail. And I give him a pass. What I mean is, he just about did what he needed to do. He got physical with Holland. He kept him from scoring. He probably got into Holland's head a little bit with the grappling, kept him off his game. Did he play well with the ball at his feet? No. Did he have a few ricks that had to be cleaned up by other people? Yes. Did he have one where he just literally lets the ball run by him for no particular reason? I have no idea what he was doing because his brain short-circuited. Yes. Did he get a yellow card that probably meant Saliba had to come on earlier than Mark Mikel would have liked? Yes. But he kept Holland out of this off the score sheet. He kept him off his game. And so while I might give him a five out of 10 for quality, I give him a passing grade for achieving the minimum of what we needed him to achieve. So that's, that's how I look at that. Paul, I want to go broader picture with you just for a second though. I think it's a great performance. We played our football. It measured up well. The game could have gone either way. The thing that stands out to me is the slight glass jaw that City has that I don't think they've had in the past. We created chances. We found ways to play down the flank. Trossard was brilliant. His close control was exceptional. He he plays uh, Eddie in for that near post flick that just flashes wide. We had openings here. There's a, sh a shot from Tomiyasu that's brilliant, well saved. Like, if you said to me, what's the best case scenario from this game? I know some people will say, don't say lose, don't say lose, don't say lose, but hear me out. Maybe you crash out, but you come away feeling like you might have been the better team and you rotated and you come away thinking we have nothing to fear from City when they come to the Emirates. I think that's what we achieved and I feel pretty good about it. Yeah, it was near perfect. I don't think there's going to be any kind of hangover from this for this team. They were on the pitch at City, at the Etihad. Uh, there's a great clip uh, on uh, that Pep account, there's a little clip that shows Pep Guardiola talking to John Stone saying, you can see him gesturing, play with more balls, play with more more aggression. And that's what the clip's about. And I turn it on and listen to it. But all I can hear is our away support singing the Saliba song. And it is absolutely raucous. Mm -hmm. And like, like they're watching a performance where we're absolutely matching City. Now, they get the goal, but straight after the goal, you know, we bring on Odegaard, we bring on Martinelli, we start playing our football. That chance that that Eddie almost has it, um, it's like if just a few minutes after they score their goal is every bit as good as the chance they had. It, it's just taken off Eddie's toe at the last moment. Uh, Xhaka uh, swings in across into the box. Uh, Martinelli's gone around the to the byline and cutting in, giving them problems all over the side. Like when we actually went full bore for 15 minutes after their goal, not only were we matching them, we had them on the ropes. Um, there's nothing to fear here. Uh, and like, I'm not sure, you might be totally right about Arteta didn't want to bring on Saliba or so early. I don't know. I think... Clive's absolutely right that he owed holding this game. He owed a couple of other players this game. City can rotate a little bit, and it's still basically their first 11 because they've got a big, big rotation uh, squad that they can work through that every game looks like a first 11. We're not quite there yet, so it looks like rotation to us, but it's just the fact that Arteta has 11 players. He has to start in the league. And the other has got to do a bit of rotation. I think he's delighted that Saliba got 45 minutes up against Haaland. And he absolutely bossed him. There were none of those 
holding like I, I'm with Clive. I think holding had a very good holding game given yep. his range of things he can do. I think I think it was an eight out of ten for Rob Holding, right? In terms of what he could do against Haaland. I think he did really good to to tangle him, to slow him down, to bump him. But isn't like, that why the pass fail grade is good? Like Holland yeah. didn't score on him and he got Holland off his game. Yeah. So everything else that he did, which was lumpy and weird, I'm willing to just pass him, you know, give him a passing grade and, yeah. and move on. Yeah. Whereas Saliba, he ran that whole area of the pitch mm-hmm. with Holland around there, then took the ball off him or mopped it up, spun, play made from the back. Like if I'm, I'm uh, Pep, I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> this guy's <laughs> oh, with one hand he's handling Haaland and like I know Haaland's going to have his few, few moments in any game against anybody but by and large Saliba absolutely dominated his area of the pitch where Haaland was yeah. and spun around and cut balls up the pitch up through the middle there's so much to like about this performance now none of this is entirely real till it's the Premier League and it's what what are it three games away from us we play city again then we'll see everybody's real stuff but we absolutely lived the e, even with the fact that they were knocking it around their center backs for a while possession was something like 53 46% at the at he had with our b team or a a b team mm. uh, i was really happy with how we played played with our identity uh, gave them loads to think about yeah i and I, I confess, the whole game had a very second-gear feeling about it. Yeah. Not just from City, from us as well. I think there was a lot of playing within within ourselves. I think there was, was a, lot a lot of, of willingness. Respect, we we keep the – yeah, and like maybe that tactical feeling each other out thing, right? We keep yeah. the ball a bit. They get a sense of where we're moving. They keep the ball a bit. I felt like it was a game being played at an extremely high tactical level, yeah. if not at an extremely high intensity level, if that makes sense. Um, very cerebral chess. And, and by the way – We've seen some pep games against some, I mean, some of the city Liverpool games were outrageously good, but like we've seen some pep games against other top teams in the past where it's been very chess like, right? Not filled with intensity, filled with moves and counter moves. Clive, before we get to the negative of the, of the match, and by the way, I, I think the biggest negative would have been the party injury, but the, the rumors that I've heard are it's nothing, he's fine. So I'm not even going to address it beyond that. If we had more to get into on it, I would. Um, and when we talk, Sammy, maybe we'll talk about why party had to be risked at all. But let, let's do the let's do the positives first. I think a big, big positive in this game is Trissard. You know, so much obsession with Mudrick. I get it. He's a bright young talent, but Trissard has now played twice. He's been involved in the decisive moment against United to win that match. And he played City at the Etihad and was the most threatening player on the pitch for either team. I just think he he looks like he fits. And I think he looks like he can do the Martinelli role in a slightly different way than Martinelli, right? In some ways, is where it sounds, I feel like it's more like a Saka on the left than a Martinelli on the left. Uh, Close control, cut inside, hard to take the ball off, right? Um, bring it central, let the fullback go around the outside like Tierney likes to do, whereas Martinelli's going to drive to the byline like he did on... Uh, on Walker, right? He's going to be all running, all energy, very direct. But they're both class. But but I thought Trissard was the best player on the pitch in this game, at least for a large portion of it. He strikes me as a player who, instead of being obsessed with, will he start over Martinelli or won't he? He just makes us better. And I'm, I, I thought this was a great performance from him. Yeah, I really like that description, Elliot, I, I, of him being like Saka. That, he's got enough pace to be like Saka. You can't really look at him... I thought originally a bit more Smith Rowe like because of the areas of the pitch he takes it, but Smith Rowe's unique in his profile, and I think he's better off the ball, shall we say? I think his arrival into the box mm-hmm. is really, really good, and so I think that description is a creative, sprinting wide man. That, but Saka's got more top end speed, right? We 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 know that. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. Um, but that's a really good description. Yeah, I, I like the player. I like his two footedness. Little double step over left foot shot. Nice. Keeper on the stretch. Their goalkeeper's good, by the way. I re- he really impressed me. Um, great, great kicking. Kicking under pressure. So did ours, by the way. Our yeah. backup keeper had a nice day, I thought. Yeah, I, I like him. You know, I like him. And I, mm-hmm. I, I think he's got something. You, you, like I say, you don't come from where he's come from and end up at Arsenal Football Club unless you've got the propensity to learn. And he obviously has got that. And he's a very special very special character and I'm so glad we've got him in our club. All right, so so Trossard, I think um 
yeah, I think he's nice. But I am not comparing him to Martinelli. Uh, I'm just comparing him. I'm just saying he's a front five player. That's it. Mm-hmm. And we're going to need to plug and play him. You know, and he can do a lot of stuff. And he and he could give us a variation. You know, Martinelli, we, Elliot, you had your worries about him in 2023. Well, those worries disappeared in the 20 minutes he had on the pitch, didn't they? And on he looked this back game. to his best, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, and then you start to think, well, actually, if you know, if Eddie's now suddenly playing every single week, could they both play? You know, is the energy will drop out of Eddie, which it's all after the game Eddie and Saka had against Manchester United. It's no surprise to me they brought their B game to this pitch. You know, they were okay, but they weren't they weren't Man United okay. You know, because they were just top of the world on that day. Mm-hmm. But the it's an emotional drain, right? So, and Smith Rowe would have definitely started if if he was available. Maybe one of them wouldn't have done, and then they'd be resting. You know, so um, like Odegaard was allowed to have a bit of a sit down and watch the game develop. You know, so so yeah, I like the player, and I, I do, I'm not so I'm holding court on him only because I think there's more to come. I think he's he. I know it sounds crazy for a 28 year old. I think he's got loads of development ahead in mm. our team. I really do, positionally and personality-wise, what he decides he wants to do. Because he wasn't afraid, was he, to take the lead? He, he's a bloke, right? He's not a kid. He's a bloke, you know? mm-hmm. and he's and he's ready to he's ready to roll. So I, I really like him. Really like him so far. So it's really good signing. Yeah, and and I think you're right. Like he played false nine for Brighton at times. He could come in if Eddie needs a day off or he could come in for Eddie if Eddie's fading. I think one of the things both with Martinelli and Eddie is that they have this season been excellent. Both look to me more like 75 minute players than 90 minute players or 70 minute players. And I think especially where Martinelli's concerned, when the energy starts flagging, you lose a lot of what makes him special. So being able to share a game with someone who can come in and, and not have our level drop, I, I think makes us a lot more dangerous. Paul, I'm wondering if you think there's any anything to this idea of learning. I mean, so like in my mind, I'm like, well, we learned a lot. We played City. They didn't rotate much. We saw what they have about them. We can feel good that we can match them. But like in this day and age where every, you got video of every angle, you can watch them on film over and over and over again. Maybe it doesn't mean anything, but I still think on the grass, up against them, feeling how they play, how they move the ball, what it's like to grapple with Holland. Like, I think there's learning here. And I just wonder... Do you think Pep kept something in reserve? Do you think there was something about let's not show them what we're about? What do you think about the tactical chess match here and what we may have learned or not learned that will benefit us in, let, let's just say it, what could be a title decider if we can beat City at the Emirates? Because like, without wanting to get ahead of ourselves, it puts them in a position where they have to then count on us dropping like it's not just good enough for them to go on a tear at that point. At that point, it really does become about what we do. So, what do you, what do you think we may have learned? What do you think about this chess match? Um, like these guys know all about each other. It's just how they set. They'll set up slightly different in each game, and the dynamic in each game will be different. Uh, Pep pretty much described this game when I rewatched it, uh, having heard Pep describe uh, how we went at them. It kind of changed how clearly you you can see what's going on. He basically says we go man to man. And like, we often do a bit of man to man in this, in in those outfield players, it's absolutely one to one across those 10 players on the pitch, which is really, really interesting. Once you go and have a look at it, it's not what we normally do. Um, He said, we pressed aggressively. And you see that as you might expect up front, he says the only free man on the pitch for them or the free man was their goalkeeper. In other words, that's how man to man we were. There were no free man because we were one to one all over the pitch. Wherever they went, we went. And uh, y- you can see it literally guy standing beside guy all over the pitch. It won't always be like that. Each each game will have its tweak. Uh, Pep will start a little differently. Arteta will start a, uh, differently, but in this game, and I think we'll see this more than once, maybe because it's away from home, we went a little leads on the one to one, and I think that's why we did better in the first half with Party to agree than with Sambi in the second half. In that, one of the things you do if you're Pep and you're going and you know you've been marked man to man is you pull the 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 two midfielders, the two pivots when you're in possession, 
miles apart to open up the middle, like that time Chelsea did us with Pablo Marie and uh, Lukaku. One of the things they did was they pulled our midfielders miles apart to open up that gap to feed Lukaku up the middle. So in this game, they were pulling Sambi all over the place. And like party would have been marking man to man, but he's much better feeling where he needs to be positioning wise, stealing that extra yard or two, his understanding with Xhaka, etc. I think that was a big element in the second half. Um, and the other thing he implied was they created four lines with their keeper, their normal three lines in the outfield gave them four lines. They were basically using their keeper as a fourth line and going long to Holland. And we like, you don't normally associate city going long, but they kept banging it long to Holland, especially in the first half hitting Holland and knocking it in behind. And like, I do think tactically each game is going to be uh, interesting and different. We didn't see mm. Bernardo Silva till a little later on. I think that changed the dynamic a little bit. We had yep. Zinchenko against Silva over on that left pocket. And like there was a real battle between those two, two quick technical players in, in tight spaces. Um, and I think Zinchenko did really well defensively against him and started to boss the play in attack. So I, I just think it'll be very American uh, sports series of games with tweaks from game to game, like in the NBA, it, in the later uh, playoff rounds and each game will be an adjustment to the one before. I think it's fascinating what's coming up over the next two games with them and next season and the season after as they, these guys jostle with each other. Yeah. And like, I, I think what you come away with from playing that you can't come away with from just watching film is understanding that the intimidation factor isn't there anymore. I, I've watched so many games where we just, we didn't really belong on the pitch with Manchester City. Yeah. And then that started to change. And there was the game, the home game in January of last season, right? The one that was kind of taken from us. We outplayed them for a long stretch of that game. But I felt like we were playing at the very edge of our capability. You know what I mean? Like, like we were at 105% of what we could do to just about stay on level terms or, or slightly ahead of City. And it was a bit more counter-punching, wasn't it? Little bit. I mean, party was so elusive in the in the heart of the midfield. We had yeah. some territory there. But but my point with this is I felt like equal teams were on the and we were rotated, but that our system, our how we were spread across the pitch, how we handled what they wanted to do, I didn't feel that we were withstanding city. I felt that we were matching city. And so if nothing else, I think we we will go into that game in the Emirates feeling that we have the ability to play with and beat City using our football. Now, let's be clear. They're still fantastic. They could come to the Emirates and win. They could come to the Emirates and draw, or we could beat them. Those are the three outcomes possible in football. But and like, they can still go up a level from how they're playing sure, at the moment. Sure, so can we, right? But, yep. but I guess what I'm saying is that like, like those games will be close, and no one will know how they're going to turn out. But what I know now, I think, is we are going to be a match for them and we are going to be able to play our football. And they, if nothing else, the thing that has changed a lot, I believe we will create our chances to win the game against City. There was a period of time where you'd play City and you'd be like, it's their ball. We can't have it. Maybe you kick it long to Aubameyang and he runs in and you get lucky. But outside of that, you're not going to create anything. We're going to create chances. We're going to have opportunities to win. And that is a big improvement over where we've been. Clive, we... We unfortunately have to, to talk about some negatives from the game, I think. And, you know, sometimes when a player is going through a hard time, even just analyzing them can feel like picking on them. It's not picking on them. It's just analysis. Sammy Lukonga had, I think, a, a not great performance. And I think it is telling that he wasn't trusted to start. I think El Nenny would have started if he was fit. But Sammy didn't start. Party started. And I am pretty sure Mikel, of all the people he likes to rotate, I'm pretty sure he would have liked to have rotated Party, and he couldn't. Party had to come off due to an injury that, again, to his ribs, doesn't sound like it's major. But Sambi comes on. And this is why the YouTube comps don't work. YouTube comps can show you all the things Sambi is actually quite good at. Getting on the ball, shifting it from foot to foot, playing a little dagger ball, playing a pass into a good space. 
It can't show you what players do off the ball. And positional football, especially the way we play it with Mikel, is so connected to the intensity off the ball. And if you just look at the Alvarez shot followed with the follow-up, which, by the way, I mean, it's a phenomenal finish. Like, it's the only place he can go in. Samby's just, he's got a nice little rocking chair in the middle of the of the pitch there to see it all happen. His intensity off the ball doesn't work. And then when the fa- when the players went to clap the fans, he he, he just went straight down the tunnel. I was kind of thinking, Clive, before this, that maybe we're reading too much into the mental state thing with Sambi that we're that we're projecting. Now I'm not so sure that's the case. So do you have a take on the performance and maybe the the state with this guy? And is it maybe just the, the time to accept this didn't work out? Good player, not for us. We're going to be moving on from one another. All right, first things first. There are games and there are top six games away from home, and mm-hmm. to say that he he might not have started anyway over a guy that's got 80 caps for his country, that's experienced away from home. This is one of the oldest teams we picked as a group. Average age is it was 26-odd age. And so I, I don't read too much into that. Um, I did um, – someone posted a comment. Can, can I like, stop you? If El Nenny was fit, do you think El Nenny would have started? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because El Nenny is, is the six, and we would have put party in in an oxygen tank. And that's it. Let's rest up, mate. <laughs> okay. We've got okay. we've got a big season ahead. Might, might be excessive, but okay. Well, we don't. <laughs> you play, we don't lose. That's that's the truth yeah. of it. So why yeah. do you play him in a game you don't really want to win? You know. So yeah. um, so that's that's that. And so the good thing I I I get annoyed when people talk about well, not not annoyed. I don't get annoyed about much in life really. But what I will say, I get frustrated, shall we say, when it comes to comms, because look at them properly, mm. and. Then do your research around them and find out what's really happening. Because there is a lovely comp out there of Sam being playing against Newcastle last season. And I looked at his <coughs> board, spraying the ball across the pitch, left to right, left day, pinging it around, traveling it, receiving it, flicking it out to Tierney on the overlap, in a little pocket there, Martinelli ahead of him. He's just sitting there cruising, switching it out to Saka across the pitch. It's a beautiful comp. There's one guy in the middle of the pitch next to him, and it's called Thomas Pye. So his responsibilities have now switched to what he can do on the ball, which feeds into your point, on the ball player. Get me on the ball, I want to play. Now when you move him back inside, and then you put him in a situation where you need to have your, you know, your head spinning around defensively and offensively, I think he finds it easier to concentrate get on the ball so what does he do so when you have a weakness how do you master weakness what he does is he stands in his back four and he disengages so he's like, you know what i don't want to let the lads down i'll stand back good players step forward into the tulips have you used that phrase before step into the tulips get in amongst it engage create transitions he doesn't feel confident to do that at the moment so what do we do we look at that part of the pitch that says well why isn't Sambi standing there so what happens then Shaka then decides well you know what I know he's not quite at it I'll come a little bit flatter and now he's not thinking about his jobs and those shots came from Shaka's area not from Sambi's area the original shot were coming from Shaka's area so I'm thinking where are you now going (laughs) And yeah, and I'm not I'm not killing Shaka because he's now adjusting to somebody he's got to babysit. The one thing we did say last week, and no one tends to agree with me. Oh, I'm, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's, I, I I don't know why we don't use Shaka in the six. It's like people say, "Oh, Clive is going to get sent off." Well, no, he ain't. Well, just put him there. It's like when you're walking your kids through a a shopping centre. You have the dad walks in front and the kid walks behind. You lead the way. Why is he standing up the road when he should be leading the team from the back? Lead the team from the back. He should be standing in the middle of the pitch, using his passing ability and using his defensive awareness ability, which comes with being 30 years of age, having 100 caps for his country. Why are we Mm. having the kid standing behind him doing a role that he's not suited for? We've seen he's not suited for. We've seen his best moments. Comfort him, not by standing next to him, but by standing behind him and setting forward to get on the ball. And I just think it's the best use of resource. Now, if Sammy's on his way out and you want to keep Shaka in the eight, then that's up to you. But I, you know, I don't really care about this game too much. But I don't understand why we're not looking at this option for a position 
I thought we could find out a bit about Shakari in the six. Can, can I propose? Can, can I propose? Yeah. Well, because maybe, I mean, maybe the, the opposite is true, right? Which is the, the manager really needs to see if Sambi can be the party backup while El Nenny is out. Well, and he the, the saw manager, he can't. The but, manager's way smarter than all of us. And trust me, we've all seen Well, I, you know, speak we, for yourself. We've all you seen like I... we, we sat together at Everton last game of the season, didn't we? And we yeah. saw it then. And we are, we're just blokes. Right? So, like, mm. we all see it. And this is not back to what I said to you about the Newcastle comp. He wasn't playing in the six when he had that great game. You know? So, yeah. I just feel... So I now look for options. So you, there are options out there, by the way. There's not just this option. You could play Kieran Tierney, play, play Zinchenko inside. You could do you could do something like that. You could play and Trossard. Yeah. You could play Trossard at the eight and play Shaku behind him, right? Some people say, and a lot of people, as you know, smart people say, bring Odegaard back in, play Shaku and Odegaard together, and use Vieira as a goal scoring ten, and push him into the team. There are options of plenty. We have a new player we don't know enough about yet that has spent time in centre midfield in Kivio. Is that an option down the road? It's an option on paper. We haven't seen him on grass yet in shorts, so I can't really comment on that. There are options available to ensure that we don't leave ourselves defensively exposed in this part of the pitch. Now, it didn't matter against Man City, because we don't care. We're already on the league train, Europa League train for some. It's league title or bust. So we don't care most of us, or should I say some of us, I can't speak for everybody, some of us don't care. And I'm one of those people that don't care, as long as we had a good performance. But I felt yeah. there was an opportunity to see options in the six to de-risk the risk we carry with Thomas Party, who is basically the best player in his position in the league. Simple as that. And we yeah. haven't got an alternative, and we didn't discover anything new in this game. So that's the only bit I felt we missed out on from a learning perspective. Because you don't you don't lose, you learn. I don't think we learned enough about about number six. And maybe it's because they know something we don't. That there's going to be another party option. Oh, <laughs> and you, and you, that's the guy who's going to be me there beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> that could be the reason. Paul, I know you wanted to weigh in on this. And then I want to start to wrap. I, I don't think this game, when you, it's funny, right? You would never think, oh, Manchester City game, one we don't have to dig too deeply into. But like, I think at the pace it was played and the intensity level of the game and clearly the rotation and our eyes on other things and glorious failure kind of comes to mind, right? Like we created chances. We could have won it. We gave up a goal that maybe it's preventable, but it's also a nice finish. No one got humiliated. Like everybody goes home feeling okay about how the thing turned out. Um, yeah. fi final thought on, on what we take away from this. Yeah. Like I a hundred percent agree with what Clive said about the jacket thing, play him as the six, his his view on Sammy, I think that's all right. Like uh, the the one percent, if there's one percent left from my hundred percent agreement, where I see a slightly different is, I think. Uh, well, there's a couple of things. Arteta two percent really, yeah, <laughs> doesn't like making two changes with one change. So he was never going to want to, by his philosophy, move uh, Xhaka from the eight to the six, play somebody else at the eight. Um, and it makes sense in particular in this game because like we were going to learn something new how does trossard fit in and how do we bed trossard and how do we get him how feeling do we bed trossard yeah i don't know maybe like a nice chianti and a card and some flowers I mean, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's how you bet him i don't know it works for me that's how Elliot, I, I will leave the smut to you <laughs> to be um, fair it's not chianti it's it's a cabernet for me but it, you will not leave the smut to me let's are you not his liver or are you betting him um, <laughs> With some fava beans <laughs> yeah so uh where was i yeah so no i idea. think uh, there, were, there was ground to be covered here for Trossard, getting him into the system, bedding him in, in. and uh, making him feel at home, uh, other players learning how we play. And also, I think he wanted to keep up the level of the performance of this team against City by for the same reasons, keeping players mostly in position. Sambi knows the gig. He may not be great without the ball. The team knows how they play. May not be great with Sambi without the ball, uh, but everybody else is in position. People know the deal, and we got to see Trossard was the our our best player in the first half, and that's a real win, right? 
that yeah, gives agree. everybody a good feeling about mm-hmm. how we roll forward. Now he's a real option to start or to come in. So I do think there was a, that would have been paramount in Arteta's thinking about why, where, if, and I agree with you, right? If if no other option was coming in, uh, but there might be an option, uh, yeah. and I agree with Clive, like this was a match to if this is what we are set up for the next six months in the run in five months, then yeah, play Jacques at the six because we need another option to party. Um, and but hopefully we have another option. But I can see why his priority was, for example, making the left hand side of the pitch function at a high level against City. And we get that behind us. And now we go into our next game. He can start Martinelli or Trossard and we can move on and everybody's got confidence and he's in. It works. We know it works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be interesting. The ironic thing is like, I was kind of okay with also kind of throwing away the Europa League, but if we get Caicedo in and you can suddenly start a Trossard and an Enkedia and a Vieira and a Caicedo and like, you can go pretty strong. Tierney, Tomiyasu, Kivior, right? You you can go pretty strong all the way up and down. This is starting to feel like a title contending team in terms of depth too, assuming we can get that one midfielder over the line. I thought Tim had it best on the instant reaction, <laughs> a beige performance from Vieira but that's kind of okay, right? He didn't stand out at the level an Odegaard does. He was fine. Do we need to get him on the ball a little more and find ways to integrate him more? Yes, but we'll. I think we'll see better opportunities for that. I want to leave it there, but I can't because Clive is unmuted, which means he wants to say something on the beige no, Vieira performance. No, Please go I ahead. Just, I think he's, I'll, I'll keep it tight because mm. he, I think he's a very interesting player that we need to understand. And as soon as we do, he's going to do something quite special, I believe. I agree. I think... I'm not sure how to do it, Elliot. I, I, I think he could fly if he's near a Martinelli because they seem to connect with each other really I think you well. could play him in Shaka's role in lower in, in games against teams where you know you're going to dominate on the ball and give him a chance to really show his 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 skill on the ball. You know. Yeah, I think he's more mobile. He's He smells things a little bit differently. I, when Saka had the ball, Odegaard knows exactly what lane to stand in so he can receive it. He was slightly off. And Saka was hesitating and getting too much involved into one on ones because he just he just he just did. It just timing cohesion was off. Um I I I wanna see him get close to the team. I'm just not sure how. And I'm not sure what scenario yet. But yep. trust me, you know when Eddie had that near post shot when Trossard went left wing yep. and Eddie flashed across the front post. If Eddie was was actually off his game and actually missed it. Vieira's right behind him for a side foot. And that's yes. his ability. End product. He knows where to be around that box. And so hey. I think there's more to come from that player. You can clearly see the skill. I just think he needs he needs a position that he and also like if he were to come in when he comes in for Odegaard, he's coming in for arguably the best player in the Premier League right now. Hard to do. We're gonna leave it there. We'll knock it on the head. We've got a whole week to look ahead to Everton. We might even get a first half United rewatch in over on the Patreon side. We did a Kaiseido scouting video on Patreon if you want to check it out. And if that transfer happens, we'll come back and we'll talk about it more. If the transfer doesn't happen, we'll come back and we'll we'll talk about uh how Edo and Mikel need to go and the, the owners should be sacked and, and whatnot and all the usual. So Clive's on Twitter, Clive PFC. Thank you, Clive. Thank you very much. Paul's on Twitter, Pause My Pants. Thanks, Pause. Woohoo! My name is Alex Smith, the Man Twitter, Yank Gunner. Whole week to look ahead to Sean Dyche's Everton. We'll see how that goes. Okay, we love you. And we will talk to you after Arsenal 10, Everton 0.